Um, so hi, thank you, Lindsay, for introducing me. Thank you guys for coming. I know some of you are getting credit for it. I'm very happy that now people are getting credit to listen to me talk. I think that's pretty exciting. Um, so I just wanted to spend about 30 minutes talking about my background, how I ended up starting a condom company with my dad, um, and then just kind of take you through our product and why it's different um, and who we're targeting with our marketing, and then just spend a good amount of time letting you guys ask me any question you have. Um, sorry, let me make sure this is going. <laughs> oh, I see it. So um, just really quickly so I can give you some context, I was actually, I grew up in Vermont. Um, I spent most of my life kind of embedded in my family business, Seventh Generation, which they founded almost 30 years ago. Um, so I grew up just completely surrounded by sustainability and green products and, you know, corporate social responsibility to me wasn't really something I ever realized wouldn't be a part of a company. I thought just from spending so much time at Seventh Generation and working in different parts of the business that it was just something that every company, especially a consumer products good company, kind of had. It was just kind of an essential part of the business. So um, when I started college, which I also went to NYU as an undergrad and started interning for a bunch of different companies, I started to realize that that wasn't really the case. Um, I worked at a lot of big companies that, you know, sustainability wasn't really important to them. And, you know, I saw this huge disconnect because I saw all these really big companies that could make a huge impact if they changed such small things in their supply chain or employee policies, but I didn't see it really happening. Um, so when I gra was graduating from college, I kind of um, decided if I should, I was deciding between joining seventh generation and kind of going back to work with my family, which at the time I decided not to do. Um, which obviously things have changed since then. But I decided to go work for a big ad agency and work with these Fortune 500 companies because, you know, not to say that you're not all super ambitious and going to change the world, but as a 21-year-old, I thought I could obviously make, you know, big companies like Pepsi and Coke listen to me and change their actions. Um, I was a little naive at the time. I think things are changing, though. And I went to work at this branding and ad agency and was just really kind of, although I was learning this great skill set, which is something I definitely encourage, you know, young people to do is go work at these big companies because you'll get trained in a way that you still really can't at a lot of startups. I got these skills and then I kind of didn't really feel like I was having an impact. So I was starting to figure out what I should do next. So I decided to go back to school, which I, again, also highly encourage. I think you should spend as much time in school as possible. Um, you'll see as soon as you graduate why that's the case. And so I decided to go back to school and get my MBA and really focus in on what type of business I could be in and what my role could be in order to have that impact and make that change that I was kind of always craving um, while I was in and after I graduated college. And also just what I was familiar with from seventh generation. So while I was in school, I kind of, I, I said, okay, maybe I don't, you know, may, I, I, didn't, I didn't have that entrepreneurial gene in me, or I didn't think I did yet. So I was trying to kind of, you know, what can I do, though, within these big companies that might allow me to make a bigger impact? So I ended up working at a big CPG company in their CSR department over the summer in between my first and second year. And although I felt like I was able to kind of make a little bit more change. What I was noticing was these big corporations weren't really incentivizing their employees based on any sustainability actions or efforts. And that just kind of led this disconnect throughout the whole organization. So, you know, what I really saw that was clear there was that if the CEO of the company isn't incentivizing people based on making good, responsible decisions, the rest of the teams, whether it's marketing, finance, you know, operations, aren't really going to function in that sustainable manner because that's just not how they're being incentivized and not how they're being rewarded. Um, so I learned a good lesson there, which was that, again, you know, working in CSR at a really big company that wasn't kind of mission-driven, wasn't the place for me. And my father approached me 
with this idea that he'd had 20 years ago, which was to start a condom company. Um, and I, you know, we are a very close family and there are a lot of, you know, we're very open, but I still felt, you know, I was like, okay, condoms with my dad. Also, I didn't really know if I wanted to start a company, but as I had kind of had this lesson over the summer about CSR and these other kind of experiences within large companies, I kind of felt like, all right, well, this seems like the logical next thing. I need to give it a shot. I need to be able to make an impact every day. I need to be able to feel really good about what I'm doing um, and kind of see the whole company as a big system. So that, sorry, that was kind of a long-winded of how I got here. But uh, so that's when I decided last summer that I would join my dad in founding Sustain, um, which I'll talk to you about now. So a lot of people, you know, when they think about sustainability in business, they ask us, well, why did you choose condoms? There's so many other big issues in the world. You know, do you really think condoms is the best way to address all of them? So when we talk about condoms and we think about condoms and business in general, we think about everything from a kind of systems thinking perspective. And what we thought about when we were deciding to go with condoms was we realized that condoms can really address so many different social and economic issues in the world. Um, you think about something like family planning and AIDS. Obviously, condoms help prevent AIDS. They also help families plan better and they prevent unexpected pregnancies. But, you know, having family planning reduces things like hunger and poverty. It creates greater social and economic equality. So we kind of talk about Sustain as a company that really connects the dots. Um, and I'm happy to, if you have questions later, take you through more of this. But this is just kind of the general overview of why we decided to go with condoms, because we feel like with that we can address these six major social and economic issues that are currently, that currently exist today. So that's kind of like the why go into this type of business. But then, you know, the natural next question is, well, what is so sustainable about your actual product? So our product is, in terms of sustainability, it's different in two major ways. First of all, um, what my father Jeffrey discovered over 20 years ago when he had this idea about a sustainable condom was that there was this huge deforestation going on in Brazil in all these rubber, rubber plantations. And what we've kind of learned since then is that the rubber industry, although it's not talked about a lot, is one of the dirtiest industries in the world. There are extreme amounts of child labor. People are dying constantly on these plantations. The conditions are awful. So when you think about, you know, that sort of business and ru the rubber industry, we obviously didn't want to go into a dirty industry, so we had to find a solution. So what we've found is the only fair trade rubber um, plantation in the world, which is in India, and we're sourcing 100% of our rubber from there. Latex, which our condoms are latex, because that's another kind of natural question that people ask when they think about a sustainable condom. Um, and the latex is actually the sap from the rubber trees. So we're actually tapping these fair trade certified rubber trees to get our latex to then move to our manufacturing facility, which is also in India. Um, the next, so that's kind of the big, our resource and making sure it's as sustainable as possible. And then the second thing is we found out that 80% of condoms based on a German study that the government did about a year ago were found to have extremely high levels of nitrosamines, which are a carcinogen. Um, this is a carcinogen that exists in a lot of places in the world. It exists in latex. It in, exists in certain types of food. But we just thought it was so ridiculous that a product that was actually supposed to protect you and that's for women really going inside of their body could actually be causing you harm. So we found someone who had worked for um, Durex for about 25 years who had come up with a manufacturing process that eliminates, or not eliminates, that prevents these nitrosamines from being created in the heating and molding of the latex. Um, so basically what happens, I'll, so you can understand how a condom's made, is you tap the rubber trees, the latex pours out, you transport the latex to the manufacturing facility, and then it's poured onto um, big glass structures that, you know, I'm sure you can imagine what they replicate. And then it's heated and molded into that structure. And what we've done is we've added a chemical into that process that's not toxic to prevent these carcinogens from occurring in the latex. So those are the two kind of biggest components to how our product is sustainable and certainly more sustainable and toxin-free than the other products on the market. 
we have a lot of other aspects of our business where, you know, employee ownership and the way we treat our workers and we were, the way we make sure our manufacturing facility and our rubber plantation are treating their workers, et cetera. But those are the two fundamental sustainable aspects of the product. Another part kind of we also think of this as a system is we have a better product. I'll go into kind of how we're marketing that product and how we're kind of empowering women through that product. And then to complete the circle, um, we're giving back 10% of our profits to women's reproductive health in the U.S. Because a lot of what a lot of people don't realize, and which I certainly didn't realize until about the past year, was that a lot of the the rates of unplanned pregnancy and STDs are actually worse in some parts of our country, especially in the South, than in a lot of developing countries. So you have a lot of other condom brands who, you know, have the buy one, give one Tom's shoe model, which is definitely great. But what they're doing is they're really just taking these products and kind of dropping them in certain places in Africa or parts of the developing world, and they're not really educating them on how to use them. So if you give condoms to women or men in places where they don't know why they should be using them, they tend not to use them. So by focusing on the U.S., we figure we can put our efforts and resources towards education, awareness, and also product. So to really kind of complete that circle. Um, so this is just kind of taking you through what I talked about, how our condoms are made and then how they enter the market and then how we're kind of taking that and giving back um, to complete the loop. So something, you know, as this is, as we were coming up with this idea, we were looking, you know, something that I did in my previous life in marketing was looking at kind of the marketplace and looking at the other brands out there and figuring out where we could kind of come in and really make a big difference. So if you go currently into a drugstore or pharmacy or supermarket or wherever you buy your condoms, which I hope you do, um, you'll notice the shelf is completely male-oriented. Everything is really bold. Everything is really aggressive. Everything's kind of about the guy. And it's interesting because what we also discovered was 40% of condoms in the U.S. are actually bought by women, but they're bought by women, and these women are having these really terrible experiences when they're buying condoms. So, you know, from all the research we've did and all the women we've talked to, women are uncomfortable when they're going into the store. They're standing under the fluorescent lighting. They have some, like, young guy who's in high school working behind the counter kind of, like, laughing at them while they buy the product. And we just thought this was a huge disconnect because we were like, these women are doing something really great. They're protecting themselves. Um, and they're, you know, being responsible when it comes to their sexual health. And then they're feeling really embarrassed or ashamed about it when they're actually going to make the pur purchase, which is probably going to discourage them a little bit from doing it again. So we were like, okay, this is obviously a huge opportunity. We didn't feel like any of the brands out there are really addressing women's needs, whether the packaging, the messaging, the actual product. Um, so we figured from a marketing perspective, women were a great idea. And then we kind of took it a step further because of kind of what I was talking about before. We felt like, you know, over time, this has all been the guy's responsibility. The guy's the one that's supposed to have the condom. Women are supposed to just kind of sit back and expect the guy to take care of this. Um, and we felt like, and I especially as a woman, felt really irritated by this because guys buy condoms, they carry condoms, and they're kind of rewarded for it. They're seen as really cool, and, you know, they're getting laid, sorry, excuse my language, and they're really, you know, it's something to be, like, feel good about. And then women buy and carry condoms, and they're looked at as being sluts or as if they're being kind of promiscuous. And I just thought, you know, it's 2014. This is completely ridiculous. Women are so empowered at work. You know, they're eating well. They're doing all these different things in their lives to make themselves feel great. And then when it comes to sex, they're still, still kind of ashamed about it. So... That was kind of my personal reason for another reason that we were going to focus on women. Um, so kind of going back for a minute to the packaging and kind of the shelf set, because I kind of walked away from that mentally when I was talking. Um, so we went in and we looked at the shelf, and I was like, okay, this is a huge problem. Our most important thing is going to be our packaging. So I'm just going to show you. I don't know if anybody has seen it already. Um, So, hold on one second. I guess you can see it's big enough. You can see it. 
Um, so basically, what we did with the packaging was like, based on this insight that women are embarrassed to carry condoms, and a lot of guys don't like you carrying them either, um, we wanted to put something together that looked totally different, something that would ca grab your attention, but also something that you would feel really good about carrying in your bag. I mean, our dream is to have like a condom in every single woman's purse in the US. And we figured they're not gonna do that with these kind of big, bulky, loud, masculine um, condoms that are currently out there. So obviously our packaging's completely made from recycled material. And how it works is that you kind of have these really beautiful condom foils that don't look like condoms at all with these natural patterns on them so that if it happens to fall out of your bag, eventually we wouldn't want you to be embarrassed at all, but we know we can't change consumer behavior tomorrow. You wouldn't feel like this, it's not like a tampon falling out of your bag. It's kind of like this beautiful thing that you feel comfortable carrying. Um, so that's kind of, there are a lot of other ways that we're talking to women and a lot of other ideas that we have, but I'll kind of wait till questions um, so that you can kind of ask me as many as you want. But basically, I want to, oh, sorry, almost there. Um, basically, that's kind of why we decided to focus on women, and those are the insights that we kind of took into entering this category. And I think that's, all I'm going to say for now and then wait. I'd rather you guys ask me questions because I know I've covered a lot of different areas of the business and what we're doing in my life. So I'll kind of end it there and then let you guys ask me que any questions you have. <laughs> so great question. <laughs> Wish I had an answer for you. Um, so we're... I'll, no, you can't buy them yet. Um, if you could buy them, I would have a big box of them and just be handing them out to everyone. Um, basically, condoms are a class two medical device. So in going through our production and manufacturing, we're going through the FDA. So it's not really a product that we could kind of have the idea and produce tomorrow. So we're hoping to be in the market by the end of May. I mean, we are. There are a few niche brands out there. Um, we really look at our competitors, though, as Trojan and Durex. I think, and it's it's. I think some of the other small brands are doing a really good job of, you know, having these new brands in this category and kind of changing the game. But something that one of the retailers we met with said, which was really interesting, is that. A lot of new brands enter this category as just kind of like trendy brands, like, oh, they have really cool packaging or, you know, a really cool ad campaign, but there's no longevity to it. So I think since we're focusing on women, I think that we don't have as many competitors when you look at it that way. So Trojan did try and do this about, I think it was like four or five years ago, um, and they failed. I think um, the first part of your question in terms of that, what they would do to rip this off, when we polled women and talk, we talked to about 500 women and then about 200 more kind of in focus groups, Trojan and Durex have such strong brand names and they're so, you know, it's such a male brand that I'm not sure if Trojan kind of just had a sub-brand of Trojan and positioned themselves as like appealing towards women that that would necessarily feel authentic and that women would kind of appreciate that or respond to that. But I'm sure if they came up with a totally new brand. Um, I think something that we talk about at Sustain is that also, you know, uh, what's the word? Imitation is kind of like the biggest form of flattery. I think we would love for women to become completely empowered when it comes to their sexuality and their sexual health. So... If Trojan and Durex want to do that, great. Trojan already has about 70% of the market, so we are not, they, and they, 
you know, their biggest concern is just kind of protecting their shelf space. So I'm not sure they're going to go into this. But I think, I mean, hopefully that day comes. And I, I don't really know what my answer would be at that point. I <laughs> first just want to get the product onto the market so I can tell her where she can buy it. Yeah, so condoms are actually the only form of contraceptions that prevent all types of STDs. S right, so I think right now we're staying, we haven't really thought about that. We're staying focused on this trend that as more and more girls are using the pill and using the IUD, they're sort of forgetting to use condoms when they're having casual sex or even when they're having sex with partners that they are dating. Um, the condoms have kind of fallen out of the equation. So our first battle is kind of recreating this awareness and the reality that STDs are going up. 25% of all women will get an STD in their first year of college. And, you know, informing them that the pill, although is great and will help you prevent unplanned pregnancy, is not going to protect you from anything else. So the great thing about this category, which was not the case at seventh generation, is that the margins are really high. So condoms are really inexpensive to make. And when you add in the sustainable aspects of the brand, you're still only adding about half a cent to a cent more per condom. So we aren't actually going to be priced at a premium compared to Trojan and Durex, which are actually already priced pretty highly. Yeah, it's some it's there's so many aspects that we want to educate about. I think and something that we constantly struggle with is like what's the most compelled compelling messaging point? Um I think when m when it comes to marketing, it's really tricky because you don't want to scare people. I mean, the last thing we want to do is create this whole campaign around uh nitrosamines and condoms and then people have another reason that they don't need to and shouldn't use condoms. So, we're being really careful about how we message and how we educate around the toxicity issue, um, the kind of women's reproductive health issues, STDs, and also all of our sustainability things. But most of, I mean, we're not, all of our um, marketing money will go towards like online, social media, online advertising, um, videos, that type of stuff. We're, what we learned in a lot of our research is that women in particular aren't, the, the people they trust the most when it comes to trying new personal care products or like sexual wellness products is family and friends. So we're really trying to figure out who these really, we call them influencers within kind of the millennial age category that women will trust in order to kind of try this new brand and also just listen to the issues that we're trying to get across. Yeah, so that was, you know, obviously we couldn't find rubber trees in the U.S., so that wasn't really an option. And the reason why we had to do our manufacturing also in India is because the latex, once it's tra tapped from the tree, can't travel very far before it's heated um, and molded. Um, yeah, we everything will be shipped by boat to the U.S., and I believe we are offsetting everything we do. But again, the great thing about this product is that it's so light. So the environmental impact of shipping it is actually pretty small compared to other types of products. Yeah, 
Yeah, there's, that, there's a lot of things that we're looking at. So we're trying to also make our product hypoallergenic so that even if you have an allergy to latex, we are reducing the protein levels in the latex in order to prevent that from happening. We're not there yet. Um, and we also did look into that. Only about 3% of women are, or I think 3% of the population total is actually allergic to latex. So we're also kind of wondering if guys sort of sometimes say that they're allergic to latex when they're not. Um, <laughs> but yeah, those are all definitely like improving the product is definitely one of the most important things to us and coming up with more options um, for our target audience. Um, so I know like protection That's a good question. <laughs> One that we were hearing that question a lot kind of in the beginning, but I haven't heard that in a while. Um, but I guess I can't ignore that from being a reality. Um, so it is an FDA approved product. So I don't know how much people trust the FDA anymore, but um, to the extent that they do, it is, you know, it's tested by the FDA. It goes through the same testing standards of any other condom sold on the market. Every single condom is actually placed on um, a device before it gets packaged that sends an electric shock through it. And if any, if any of the shock gets out, then, you know, the condom's um, thrown out. But I think, you know, I, I guess we're hoping and assuming a little bit that by saying it's an FDA-approved product and by being on a shelf next to Trojan and Direct that there isn't really that question. But it's definitely, it's, it's, a, tough, it's a tough one. It's something that I definitely haven't exactly figured out how to communicate that, mainly because people haven't been asking it recently, so it's kind of fallen off my radar, to be honest. But um, it's a really good question, and I'm, I'm hoping that by just saying FDA approved, that kind of gets us somewhere. Does the fact that you're a young woman working with your father on a business like this help get you some additional marketing inroads? I mean, it's, it's a, in itself, it's an interesting story, so does that help you get more publicity? Yeah, I mean, I think just having um, my dad be who he is has been pretty helpful, to be honest. Um, people ask me all the time. I mean, to be honest, I don't know if I would have started a business completely on my own. Uh, I don't have that uh, as big of a risk-taking ability as he does. So it's definitely helped us. And it's kind of we're actually at this really weird point where we don't want to talk too much about the product because we don't have an exact date that it's going to be on the market. Um, but I'm hoping that once we kind of push forwards with all of our PR efforts, that story, which it has to a certain extent, will just kind of help get us attention, definitely. You talked a lot about the experience that women have when they buy condoms and how it's a very negative experience. But if, if your condoms are right next to Trojan and Durex, you're still walking into the grocery store or the uh, pharmacy, and okay, I picked the prepackaged one that looks nicer and I still have that. How right. do you expect this to really change that checkout experience? So, um, yeah, something that I didn't talk about is our retail strategy. So there's sort of three parts to it. One is just these traditional condom retailers like Walgreens, CVS, any drugstore, supermarket. Um, and then a huge part of what I'm thinking about constantly is finding these, we call them non-traditional retail partners like a Sephora, like an Urban Outfitters, like an American Apparel. Um, I'm, these aren't people we're definitely selling to, but they're people I hope to be. Where we're placing the product in an environment where women feel more comfortable, where they feel comfortable asking the salesperson about the product, where they feel like the salesperson's a little more knowledgeable, and basically not forcing them to go into that section in the drugstore. Um, and then the third part is online. Women have said to us that they would love to buy their product online when it comes to condoms. Um, they just haven't thought about it. It's still, unfortunately, a big impulse purchase among most women and men, so it's not something you're planning ahead for. But we're hoping to, by selling on our site, by selling on Amazon, um, by selling in other kind of e-commerce locations where millennials are, change that behavior and making them plan a little bit more when it comes to purchasing the product. Well, 40s, 50s, and 60s, where there's an increase in HIV and a whole bunch of issues on an older level, you have a whole group 
Right, people yes. Who grow up with that as a problem, and they're, they're still single and having kids, and they are actually still having sex. Oh, no, I know they are, especially in the um, homes all over the country where the STD rates are rising. No, I mean, I think that's great and I hope to target them one day, but I think one thing that I've also had to teach my, had to teach myself is to focus. So right now our focus is, which is somewhat you know based on me being a millennial, to target myself is obviously a little bit of an easier exercise. Um, so right now we're focusing on women 18 to 34. And then, you know, maybe down the line, focusing on the older demographics. But I think right now, um, as the one person on the marketing team, I can't focus on all of those <laughs> audiences. Sure. It's, well, that's, it's again one of those things which I'm trying to resist a little bit until we know when we're going to be on the market. Um, because I've seen a lot of brands or companies of friends of mine where they start talking a lot and then the product kind of keeps getting delayed and then people tend to lose interest. Um, but I think one of the most exciting things that we're doing is, um, I don't know if you're familiar, familiar with the website Upworthy. They are a viral video site and they get you know up to 10 million views on the videos that they recommend. So an interesting way that we're using our marketing money rather than traditional advertising is trying to work with them to they will help us with everything from creating the content of the video and the concept. And then since they're kind of this approved place where people assume that anything they're posting is interesting, we hope that like through them we'll amplify our audience and get people into the sustained community. Because that's another thing that I've learned and started to struggle with is whenever we do launch, like who are we telling? Because right now we obviously have a very small audience of whoever's kind of signed up through our website. Um, so that's, I'm working to find these kind of new strategic partners in social media that will help us get the word across. Or, you know, finding somebody on Instagram that has 10,000 followers and having them post a picture of our product could actually be a lot more impactful than running Facebook ads, which I know that I don't pay attention to. Is that, should, I can keep, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think the difficult, yeah, that's obviously something, one of the first things we thought about. The difficult thing with that is giveaways are really expensive, which I didn't know before I started a company. Um, and I'm just like, you want to give your product away all the time. But there's kind of that like, okay, if you give 100 away, maybe one person, at best case scenario, is going to kind of go follow up and want to learn about that product. So we're looking for, um, and we have somebody in mind, who an organization that has kind of these women ambassadors on campus that host events and through these events give out product, um, give out condoms, give out kind of like sex and sexual health related products. So I think that we are definitely thinking about it, but we're trying to go into it a little more strategically so that we know at least half the people that get our products will have at least heard something about the product and heard why it's important and why we're such a great brand um, rather than just picking it up. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that's the, you know, doctor's offices, college campuses are all kind of part of our distribution strategy, whether it'll be this year or next year is kind of TBD. I think it's really those kind of specific skill sets that I learned. So, you know, I worked in, a, it was an ad branding agency and a lot of the work we did was redesigning packaging, um, which was kind of random and I didn't think I would necessarily be able to apply it later in life. But I spent so much time 
going into stores, going into stores with consumers, seeing how they shopped, seeing why they shopped, why they made decisions, kind of what they focused on. Um, that's just an example of something really specific, which is why I think a lot of, there's a lot of value in going to work for a big company where you're going to learn a really specific kind of how, do, you know, like when I came to Sustain and started Sustain and I was like, so, you know, my dad said, write a marketing plan. I was like, I've never done that before. I don't really know what to do. That's Those are the kind of like hard skills that I think you can learn at these bigger companies um, that will help you in a more entrepreneurial startup setting. Yeah, no, I that I mean they're still in some stores locked up, which is because they're actually stolen a lot. People take steel condoms very regularly. Um, and yes, Dollar Shave Club is definitely when we're you know when thinking about building out our own e-commerce store, which we are doing, we've definitely looked to them as a great model. Oh. Yeah, I mean, to be completely honest, we haven't com built up our organization totally yet. We've already made some small donations, but um, my other partner, which is my mother, who's here with me supporting me, is actually running the organization 10% for Women. And we focused on the South because of a report that Planned Parenthood put out, I think about a year ago, of the STD rates in the South and the unplanned pregnancy rates. I, you know, in terms of what exactly we'll be doing there and who we'll be donating to, I think that depends. I think, in a way, it's really interesting for us because there's so much attention right now on women's reproductive health care and women's rights that it will only help us kind of think of more ways that we can support this conversation and make it more of a conversation and give women the option. Um, but, yes, I'm sure we will face, there have been so many articles about women and organizations that are donating to these causes and the kind of religious right that they're facing. And, you know, that I came into this business very, like, risk averse. Like, I don't want to upset everyone. I don't, I don't want to upset anyone. Um, and the one thing my dad has really taught me is that to be a really mission-driven brand, you're going to upset some people a lot of the time, and you kind of just have to be okay with that and really own who you are to become a more authentic brand. I hope that was a good enough answer. You can ask her if you have more questions. Giving the money to um, organizations that help support reproductive health services. So not just about uh, pregnancy, not about condoms, but just trying to get services to women to go into, you know, health services so they can have a breast exam, they can have a pap smear, that they can have the complete the complete package of what they need. So it's not it's not just going to be about getting women to use the condoms. It's more about supporting them in their in their reproductive health services in a larger sense. So uh, based on your growth strategy and where you are now as a very small startup, uh, at what point are you going to be uh, ready to take on interns um, from places like yeah, say look at Camp that. <laughs> Um, it's soon. I, it's funny, something you never think of as a manager now is that when you have an intern, you have basically another job that you're also doing, which is kind of, you know, I would never want to take somebody in and just kind of send them off on their own. I think in order for myself to have an intern, I would be able, I would, you know, I would want to spend a lot of time tr teaching them, training them, making sure that they're learning as much as we're getting. Um, I think since our launch has been pushed, you know, we were hoping early 2014 and now it's looking more mid-2014, probably around the fall would be like the time that we would 
think of taking on more people because um, a lot of the people, a lot of like our finance and operations people are still only on a consulting basis. Okay, well, thank you so, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> One of the big things, I mean, you're this organization, there's so many good things that you're doing in terms of from the marketing to the supply chain. And one thing that um, I know some generations talk about, and I think in reading, you know, some of the materials for this, I'm hearing you and your father talk about the importance of business not just being less bad, but actually being good. And so there's, like, yeah, there's so many good things. Are there anything going forward that you hope to even do? That's not bad. I mean, are there other things going forward that you see yourself wanting to change or you're feeling like all the things you're doing are really, we talk about like businesses being like an agent for world benefit and really creating positive outcomes. So yeah. is there anything else that you're hoping to, to make I think, yeah, there, there are definitely small things like, for example, um, their FDA has yet to approve any organic lubricants. So um, our lubricant in our condom is actually not, completely organic at all. Um, so like that's a small thing. We're constantly criticizing ourselves and seeing where we have places to improve from everything from the product. Um, I think we're having our for first board meeting in a, few, in a few weeks, so I'm sure we'll find a lot of other things we need to improve too. But I mean, something that I actually didn't get any questions on, which I tend to get a lot of on, is like what's it like working with your dad? Um, so I think that's another area kind of in the structure of the business that we're constantly working to improve. I mean, it's very, you know, keeping our personal relationship really positive, keeping our professional relationship really positive, making other employees in the company not feel like there's this kind of crazy, intense relationship going on between him and I in meetings and like making sure we're being professional. You know, there's constant improvement um, in all aspects of the business. Well, thank you so much for having me. If you have if you have any questions or ideas or anything, you can totally email me. I will respond. Um, and if you hopefully, and if you can you can email me when we launch and remind me that you're at this talk, and I will definitely make sure you get some free condoms. Thank you so much. <laughs>